Hello and welcome to this Energy Future Exchange webinar with Wendy Sanasi and I'm Max Grunig. I work with the Ecologic Institute. The Energy Future Exchange is a transatlantic civil society dialogue on the future of energy and we had great discussions so far uh, just recently in Brussels with a conference. Of course, not everybody can travel to Brussels and should travel to Brussels. And we're very glad that today here we have an opportunity to have an online discussion. If you just joined us, so welcome. You can ask questions later. So there's three ways to do this. There's uh, the way to have a question typed in. You can raise your hand or you can also type in the chat function. Either way, I'll try to have an eye on this and try to then give you either an open mic if you're in a situation where you can speak. And if you're somewhere where you can't speak, I can also read out your question. So either way should work. Worst case, if I don't see your question or uh, we don't have time in the end, then of course we'll be happy to take your questions afterwards as a follow-up. Please also join us on LinkedIn. There's a group called EFAX and there you can ask a lot of questions or also share information both with people from the American side of the Atlantic and also the European side of the Atlantic and um, we'll be happy to continue the conversation there later. And of course there'll be also recording of this webinar online on our website energyfuturex.org. The whole program, the whole dialogue is supported by a grant from the European Union. It's really great. And uh, now I think I've said more or less enough about the program, the background, the Energy Future Exchange. So very glad to have Wendy Sanasi here today with us. She's working for EarthSpark International uh, since February 2016. Uh, she's a community engagement associate in Les Anglais in Haiti. So that's already giving us a lot of information. She's working there on the microgrid system, community microgrids in Haiti is the topic also of our conversation here. It's a lot about renewables, it's a lot about community, and it's about the microgrids. It's a lot of topics. Uh, Wendy has a background as a uh, bachelor in chemical and environmental engineering and a master's in project management. And she speaks a lot of languages. So we could do this in other languages than English. She also speaks French and Haitian Creole and Mauritian Creole. That's very impressive. So bienvenue, uh, welcome, and I hope uh, this will be a fun conversation. We already had you kind of with EFAX via video. So you'd send some videos into the EFAX conference and anybody who wants to see that later, it's on the conference site on energyfuturex.org. They're the videos that you sent us. They're really, really impressive. And um, now the floor is yours. Wendy, welcome and thank you for joining us for this webinar. Hi, Max, and hi, everyone. Thank you for the presentation. Um, so um, I'm going to talk a bit about our work that we're doing in Haiti, in uh, rural Haiti. Uh, with some uh, examples from Les Anglais, which is the town where we have a uh, microgrid that's operating right now. Um, so, uh, like Max said, I'm uh, called Wendy Sanasi. I've been in Haiti for the past three years and nine months, uh, working in rural Haiti, and it's very exciting, very interesting, uh, providing energy um, access to communities especially those who have never had it before. Um, so um, there are many challenges and a lot of lessons learned and um, a lot of opportunities as well. So um, without delay, I'm gonna uh, start my presentation. So, um, so microgrid resilience for integrated rural electrification. Um, so in this picture, you can see a small shop in Les Anglais. Um, which is operating at night with electricity from our microgrid uh, that has been there for a few years already. So um, I would like intro to introduce EarthSpark first of all. So EarthSpark International is a non-profit 
which is based in the US, in Washington, DC, having the mission of eradicating energy poverty. And uh, the way that Earthfog does it is by developing solutions uh, to uh, achieve those objectives. So Earthfog has uh, created three uh, organizations, three companies. The first one is called Energy Pop, which means clean energy in Haitian Creole. Uh, Energy Pop's mission and role actually is to uh, manage and operate microgrids in Haiti and also to sell uh, clean energy products. Um, so uh, Energy Pop actually manages the grids that are built by Earthspark International. Um, another spin-off is Park Meter, which is uh, a metering company that was created in Les Anglais. Um, so the story is that uh, when Earthspark launched the grid in, in Les Anglais, uh, we're looking for a metering, a metering company or like a product that could, um, that was adapted to the needs of the Haitian, rural Haitian population, and there was not any meter on the market that could satisfy this need. So Earthspark created uh, their own little meter, and uh, that meter is now, um, the company is now called Spark Meter, and is one of the leaders in uh, smart metering companies in the world for uh, for microgrids. And, uh, Recently, Podspan Power has been launched as well, and Podspan Power is going to be uh, the microgrid developer for um, for the next microgrids. Um, we are planning on building 24 more grids in Haiti in the next three years. So, one of the big uh, problems in uh, many rural communities and in rural Haiti is energy poverty. So. Um, over 70% of Haiti is not electrified. So the problem is not only a rural problem, but a general problem in the country. Um, many people rely on fossil fuels, on like kerosene lamps, on candles, as you can see in the pictures. Um, and you can see also a little like um, ice box with a lot of fresh fish and seafood. Unfortunately, to preserve them, uh, the fishermen have to buy ice blocks in the bigger towns and preserve them until the ice melts and sell them at a lower price before they get bad. Um, so uh, this limit the, the opportunities, um, the economic opportunities. So all those uh, fuel uh, from the kerosene lamp, the ice uh, to preserve it, the, the, the candles that are used um, are much more expensive than uh, the electricity that they would have used to actually uh, for lighting and they can even like charge phones with those or even do any business with those sources of, of energy. So our solution for this issue is to build a robust solar powered smart grids. Um, one of our motto is like the risking by doing. So we are trying to prove uh, what is possible uh, by developing those uh, innovative and scalable uh, microgrid models in Haiti. Um, they are clean because they use solar energy and batteries. And uh, actually, we have backup generators, but our aim is to like phase them out completely. They are very reliable. Uh, we have very little blackouts. Most of them right now are planned outages for maintenance reasons. And they are very affordable. Uh, we made some little like surveys, and we found out that people actually are saving between 50% and 80% uh, on their energy expenditure compared to what uh, they would spend on uh, kerosene or like charcoal. Uh, so uh, they they are really like saving money by connecting and using the electricity from the microgrid. Uh, we have a prepaid model meaning that uh, the customer don't have like debt at the end of the month, maybe because they cannot pay the electricity bill. So um, the three main pillars of our business model are community engagement, prepaid model and smart meters, uh, like I just mentioned. And also we uh, try to commercialize some uh, products like improved cook stoves. We did that in the past, we don't do it anymore but we are actually looking into electric cooking at the moment. 
uh, we sell, we have sold solar lanterns and solar home systems, and we are still uh, looking for a like, good product on the market to uh, propose to people who are not connected to the grid and who might not be able to connect to the grid uh, by virtue of uh, of the location of their homes. And we sell light bulbs, uh, LED bulbs, and electric cooking appliances and meals uh, for productive uses of electricity. So, um, yeah, we do a lot of community engagement uh, and there are different ways how we do it. Um, we, uh, before going into any town where we have the intention, the interest of developing a microgrid, we contact the local government because they are one of our main partners. Um, without the approval of the local government, we cannot do any progress, we cannot do any development in the town. So we would meet uh, the local government, meet the social workers, and then plan other meetings with the community. It could be like a, a community meeting, a public audience, where we're gonna present the project and answer questions. And those meetings, they are ongoing. They start before the grid are, the grids are being built and they keep, uh, they keep happening throughout the process. And even after the grid has been launched and is operating, we still have uh, public meetings to inform people of customer policies, of changes in, in the grid, or if they are like um, um, very important news. Um, so we, we still do community meetings, which is very important to keep that uh, good contact with the customers. Um, so we also do surveys with future beneficiaries before actually um, before actually um, subscribing customers, we make sure that we talk to them, understand what they have as appliance, what are their needs. Uh, so we, this helps us to like uh, have the load profile of the town uh, and help us like design the grid and also surveys like customer satisfaction surveys before introducing new services. Uh, as well to understand what people need and also to make sure that uh, there is like a good communication um, good communication with them. So uh, in the picture you can see um, the microgrid in Les Anglais uh, that you might have seen in the video that I sent. Um, it has 360 solar panels between 250 watts and 295 watts. Uh, and uh, it produces 93.3 kilowatt peak uh, and uh, it works 24 seven. Um, it's situated in like uh, in the market town area. So during like on Wednesdays, every Wednesday, this region is like filled with people and vendors selling products and vegetables. So it's, uh, it's in a very accessible part of town. Um, we have big customers who are connected to them, who use mails and uh, freezers. And we also have like smaller customers who only have light bulbs and, um, and phones to charge. Um, it has actually around 450 customers, but we can go up to like 600 homes and small businesses before doing any more expansion. If we want to go above that, then um, we might have to expand the our generating capacity. So right now we are in uh, doing a, an expansion phase um, where we are connecting new customers and we're also providing uh, upgrades to our um, existing customers. So this is a bit of uh, the model of Les Anglais. So you can see the generation system with the panels. We have solar inverters, battery inverters, and we have uh, lithium ion batteries. Um, that we just uh, replaced. We have those batteries are new. We got them in uh, June um, and uh, they don't take a lot of space and they are very good so far. They have, they have proven to be very good. Uh, we have a diesel generator of 30 kilowatt that is used as a backup. So in general, we don't use it. If we have rain, a lot of rain for a lot of days, and our batteries are not able to charge enough, then the generator kicks in, works for maybe an hour max, and then um, the batteries are gonna help to like provide power to the town. Um, so in the past uh, month, 
we haven't used the generator more than five hours maybe. So in the past three months, really barely, except for some maintenance. And then we have, um, so how it is, you have the generation system with the batteries, the panels, the inverters, and then we have uh, the step-up transformers, and then uh, power lines around town, as you can see in the other pictures, uh, power lines around town that, uh, and like step-down transformers that are gonna distribute electricity. And then uh, we have our meters, which are installed on the booth, and those meters, every customer has a dedicated meter. Um, that is that is used, and you can see in the picture the spark meter, which is the meter that we are actually using uh, right now in this only. Um, and you can see uh, some maintenance by some technicians happening on the other pictures, and uh, and on the picture on the right, this is Jean Noël, who is uh, one of our good advisors and a social worker in this only, and um, who is. Um, turning on the light, it was right after the cyclone when we repaired the system. That was the first time we got electricity in this only again of the cyclone Matthew. So um, just to show you a little bit of the meter, uh, small meter um, interface. So the small meter makes it very easy to manage the grid um, and manage customers. You have a lot of information. For every customer, you have a dedicated page. So if someone wants to be um, become a customer of the grid, uh, they come to our clean energy store. Uh, they're gonna subscribe for it. We're gonna do a survey with them, check their home, if it's in good condition, if it's not leaking. Um, so we can do installation and then uh, they're gonna sign the contract. We're gonna do the installation. And then every customer, when they come uh, to buy electricity, um, they can just come to our, our shop or they can buy from vendors who are spread out in town. So the vendors, if they have a smart meter, uh, a smartphone, sorry, a smartphone or a tablet that is connected to the internet, they can sell uh, electricity to any, any customer in town. So um, the customer can have access to his credit, uh, his address, all the transaction history is stored, and he can also have, look at his charts, if ever, for example, um, the customer comes and tells us, uh, I don't have any electricity at my house. Just by clicking on the charts, we might be able to solve, uh, solve the problem or at least detect why he doesn't have electricity. Maybe he went out of credits or maybe uh, he went above his uh, load limit. So we can like reset his meter or we can like give him advice what to do to like restore his electricity. So we also have a dashboard um, on, the, um, on the metering interface where we can see sales and consumption, daily, monthly data um, in kilowatt hour or in the local currency. Uh, we can easily with the uh, metering interface add vendors to the system. We can uh, top the vendors, top them up. We can Put, uh, we can change the commission percentage if ever they made a mistake in the transactions. We can, we like, I mean, we the operators, we can reverse transactions. So the vendor themselves, they don't have the, um, the permission to reverse transactions. It's only operators that can do that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, you can do many things with a smart meter interface. You can add different types of tariff. Uh, we have a load limiting capability, time of use. You can have flat rates and block rates. Um, so it's very, very easy to, to manage. And uh, you can like turn on a meter or turn it off remotely. Like for example, right now, I'm, I'm not in Haiti, uh, but from where I am, I can turn off a meter if I'm connected to the internet on the smart meter interface. So um, a little note that uh, in 2015, Earthspark International and uh, with other partners did a countrywide assessment of Haiti. And um, the assessment was based on the, the potential of having microgrids in Haiti. And um, the study showed that there were about electric, uh, 80 electrified towns in Haiti that have 
the good profile for uh, for having a microgrid. That is, there is like uh, demand density. Uh, the population is concentrated in in some regions, and people are also willing to pay. Um, so our objective is uh, by the end of 2020 of 2021 to build 24 more microgrids in Haiti. So. Um, before actually going to the next towns. So we're now trying to focus in the south of the of the country um, to, of course, benefit from economies of scale uh, and then like expand to other parts. So, uh, um, sorry. So I would like, um, like I mentioned earlier, we've had we've had like many challenges um, working in the microgrid and we learned a lot so in the picture you can see Rosanne who is our grid ambassador so her work is uh, to do like customer service uh, take new subscriptions sell electricity credit but we have also trained her to do uh, some basic electricity so right on the picture on the left you can see that she is actually uh, installing a meter on a house um, and uh, that was before the cyclone Matthew. So all the meters were installed in front of the house under the veranda. And unfortunately, um, we had uh, some bad surprises when we were looking at our figures uh, through the smart meter interface. Um, we found out that we had non-technical losses. That is um, an elegant way of saying we had theft. Uh, that was up to 80% on some of our subnetworks. So um, you can see on the right on that deal, on that wire, there is a little hole on the hot wire. And uh, this is how some customers were still interested, just by sticking a little nail and, um, and connecting a little wire before uh, the meter so that they would just bypass the meter and, and use electricity without paying it. So um, that was very unfortunate. And um, what we are doing now is we are installing the meters on poles in those enclosures. Um, it definitely is a little bit more work uh, for the installation, uh, but it has proved that we don't have uh, those kind of issues anymore. So um, we don't have to worry about electricity theft. And we also added another special meter that we call the totalizer meter. Uh, the totalizer meter is, um, is connected on, is installed on different branches of the same sub, of the, of the sub network um, so that uh, it can like monitor, uh, can monitor the electricity consumption of the meters which are connected to it. So the totalizer can help us um, see if there are technical and non-technical losses um, in those branches. So if we see that we have a lot of losses, if uh, uh, the figure that we're getting don't match, we can, uh, and if we suspect there is electricity theft, we can just turn off the totalizer meter and it will turn off uh, the whole branch. So instead of turning off, the whole subnetwork, we can just turn off like maybe a street that has like 10 customers and uh, find the cause of the losses instead of disconnecting everyone. Uh, so one of the another challenge that we are having, uh, we've been having for a while in Haiti right now, I'm, I'm sure that some of you have read the news that there is some unrest in Haiti. Um, so uh, there has been a lot of fuel shortage for a while and uh, the fuel situation has improved a little bit, um, but uh, it's still very hard to, um, to get the supply, especially in the rural areas where we are. Um, so uh, fuel is not local to Haiti. We, Haiti has to export it, um, has to import it, sorry. Um, uh, the prices are very volatile, uh, shortages happen, and then if they're in rest, you cannot even travel in the country to, to, get, the, to get the fuel. 
and uh, diesel generators also create a lot of pollution. So um, generators are not uh, are not ideal. So um, one of the solutions for that is to actually phase them out completely um, by optimizing battery and like PV use. We can oversize PV uh, production and have more batteries. So on the picture on the on the right, you can see our solar array in our next um, in a town with for our next microgrid, which is called Tiburon, and the batteries uh, that we're using right now in this only. And also, um, we can use the limiting capabilities of the smart meters uh, to make sure that we are staying within our generating capacity. Um, and of course, use time of use pricing to encourage people to use more electricity during the day when we're using PV and less at night when we're using the batteries and potentially the generator if the batteries uh, are discharged too much. Uh, another challenge that we've been having is the, um, that is also getting uh, better and better is that the, when Earthspark first started to work in Haiti, there was very limited legal framework and regulation regarding uh, the energy sector. Um, so a few years ago, a couple of years ago, ANASE uh, has been created and uh, now it is um, managing and regulating the energy sector. And uh, there has been a few development this, this year. For example, there has been an RFP for the development of microgrids in rural areas. So, um, and I'll say, however, is still on a learning curve and uh, um, is like moving slowly, but it's still uh, a very good progress uh, for Haiti. Um, so another another big challenge we've had is actually the exposure to natural calamities. Um, yeah, in uh, October of 2016, uh, Cyclone Matthew uh, made landfall on Haiti and uh, straight on the town of Les Anglais. And um, we were lucky; we lost only one pool in town, but that was one of the most critical ones. Um, it was the pool with our step-up transformers, so we couldn't distribute electricity in town um, until uh, this was fixed. We lost uh, some panels uh, from like projectiles. Uh, most of our racking did fairly well, and actually we can say that most of, compared to other microgrids in the same region, we we fared one of the we were actually one of the one of the microgrids that fared the best. So um, yeah, that was like very unfortunate. So one of our, um, we learned a lot from this uh, and uh, when we rebuild the system and for the microgrids that we're gonna develop as well, uh, we're gonna take, we're gonna use the lessons we learned from Matthew. So uh, the generation system location is very important to make sure that it's not exposed too much uh, to the wind. Um, because we lost our step-up transformer pool, probably because of the weight of the transformers, we decided that in Les Anglais, for instance, uh, the, the transformers are now installed mid-height, uh, and in Tiburon, uh, they are installed on, uh, on the base, on the concrete base on the ground. Um, meters, which were in the houses before, are now installed in boxes. So I'm gonna go back to the other picture. You can see in the little red circle, the ha there is a smart meter that's on the house, but the whole house is gone. So um, we're gonna, we decided that now we're gonna put the meters on the boxes as well because they are more secured. Um, and also uh, because in uh, most houses lost everything and the whole installation, we decided to like develop new installation that would be uh, more compact uh, and then can be can be installed uh, more quickly. So um, we all know that climate change is a reality, and uh, with climate change, uh, storms are getting bigger and more common. Uh, so we have to be prepared for that. Um, 
so what Earthwork is doing when we're doing RFPs uh, for microgrids, for building microgrids, we are making sure that uh, one of the requirements is to build um, to uh, resist extreme weather events. For example, we want our microgrids to be able to resist category four hurricanes. Um, another thing that we're noticing with climate change is that we have more and more uh, slow-moving hurricanes, and slow-moving hurricanes can mean more rain for a longer time and risk of flooding. So we also make sure that when we do our installation for our solar array or even for our batteries, that they are elevated in case of um, in case of flooding, uh, and that they are protected uh, from like, for example, in the picture this is Les Anglais. Um, the base is around two feet uh, high, and in some spots it's even higher. So one of the picture of Les Anglais after the cyclone, uh, very unfortunate, we lost uh, a lot of distribution lines uh, because trees broke, uh, branches broke, and fell on the lines. So another lesson learned is uh, doing more vegetation control. Uh, we have developed uh, tree trimming policies for our customers uh, that are stricter, and uh, our operating team uh, do regular checks, like weekly, we go in the streets and then I like, tell people when they have to trim their trees, and there have been some fines that uh, they might have to pay if they don't, um, if, they, if they touch the line or if they're very close to the line. So we're trying to educate the people on the risk as well, um, like the risk to themselves, to their kids, to their homes, uh, by having a, a tree that's very close to a line, and also making sure that whenever they're doing the trimming, that they inform us so we can um, turn off the power. Uh, and also, if they are not, if they don't feel that they can do the trimming, we can tell them, okay, uh, we're gonna do it for you, and they just need to pay a small fee uh, for that. So we're also working with the local uh, government, with the municipality, to see how uh, they can help us uh, in those tree trimming campaigns as well. So uh, because of the fact that uh, distribution lines are very fragile uh, during cyclones, uh, we feel like decentralizing community scale microgrids can really help uh, building resilience and energy security. So uh, the map you see right now is the map of uh, Haiti, and the little the circles are uh, towns that were identified to have microgrids uh, from the um, from the market study that was done a few years ago. And uh, all those towns, by having their own like uh, microgrid, means that. Uh, for example, if a cyclone comes in the north, uh, the microgreens in the south are going to be safe. Uh, the like electricity uh, will not be like uh, disrupted because of of a calamity that can happen in another part of the of the country or in a neighboring town. So I was mentioning that we are looking into like more compact installation. Uh, so we have uh, now what we call a ready board that is being installed in the house of our smaller customers. Um, we can make them locally. We just like fabricate them ourselves from all, we get all the raw materials and uh, everything is done locally, like from the cutting and assembling and then we just do the installation. It's just a little box that has a switch and uh, GFCI plugs, and uh, we can have light as well from it. So it's like very easy, um, very easy to, to remove or install. So one of our achievements this year is uh, the completion of the Tiburon microgrid. So Tiburon is another town which is around 45 minutes drive from Les Anglais, still in the south of Haiti, uh, having the same, following the same model as uh, Les Anglais, that is solar panels around the 96 kilowatt peak using 
batteries and a backup generator. And um, we are waiting to launch it, hopefully very soon, as soon as we get um, our license from the regulator, Anase. So uh, everything is ready there. We're just waiting for, for launch. And the Tiburon is around the same size of Les Anglais uh, in terms of number of houses. So those two towns are going to be like pretty similar. So uh, electricity has can have a big impact in our lives. Um, the picture in the left, you can see a woman using electricity to cook food. So uh, for those who don't know Haiti very well, most people in Haiti, even those living in the city, uh, tend to use a lot of charcoal and firewood to cook. We all know that charcoal is bad for the environment because it means destruction of trees and it's bad for health. It has a lot of smoke, it burns the eye. So we are developing a project right now with the community uh, where we are going to introduce electric cooking um, that is gonna, that's gonna be good for, for uh, the users. So uh, Edith in the picture, she's actually testing it out and she's like really happy with it. So we tested, um, induction stove, we tested an electric oven and an instant pot with a few customers and they are very, very satisfied with it. It makes cooking much easy, much quicker uh, because if you use the charcoal, you have to wait for, for the charcoal to be ready, whereas this one, in one minute, you can start cooking. On the right, this is Rosanne, our good ambassador. Um, so Rosanne was very unfortunate because she lived right outside the uh, the grid footprint, uh, so she didn't have electricity for a long time while she was working uh, with the electricity company. So um, we were able to um, to get a pool. Actually, she found a pool, a small pool, uh, a secondary pool that um, allowed us to connect her, and that was the first day she turned on electricity in her house. So she was very happy. And um, so this is Asholo. Asholo uh, is one of the very, very important figure in town. She's very popular. She is a very courageous woman. Um, and uh, she is the only uh, breadwinner in her house. Her husband is blind. And uh, she uh, makes little ice cream from breadfruit, spaghetti, and um, fruits that she, she she needs electricity for that. So she used her blender to blend the spaghetti and the milk and the fruits. And then she puts she puts them in the little plastic bags and then freeze them uh, and sell them the next day uh, to school kids. So um, if you have never eaten breadfruit or spaghetti ice cream, I invite you to come to Les Angles and have a taste. It's very good. Um, this is uh, those three women form part of a female cooperative, which is called Femme Vaillante Zangle. Uh, we collaborated with the cooperative to uh, source a corn uh, fresher. So they put the whole corn in the machine and then it takes out uh, the corn kernels. And um, it's a business for them because in general, people, what they would do, they would dry the corn on the street and then sit like for days and days and take out the corn grains like manually. Um, so um, the amount of, of uh, decanel corn, you can see in the picture on the top right, uh, if done manually, this can take four days with four people. But with the fresher, in uh, two days with two people, you can achieve the same, the same result. And also creates a little business for the female cooperative. And uh, we have street lights in Les Anglais. Um, we haven't had them for a long time. Um, like it's been a few months already and you can see the change in town like immediately. Uh, people are out selling in the streets, there are more businesses, kids are playing at night, women are going uh, out at night. It's very, 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 it's great to see this change and uh, it also adds a lot of safety. So in Les Anglais at the moment, we don't have any pipe water in homes. 
So people have to go to public wells, pump the water and then take them back home. So you can imagine if you need water in the middle of the night, you have to go out in the dark before the street lights and then come uh, get back home. If you have to cook, it's the same thing. You have to go get the water. And most of the time, it's the women who have that uh, tedious task. Women and kids actually go to get the water. So um, they, we've had like many, many customers telling us how very happy they are and how much safer they, they feel now that they have street lights. Uh, even people who don't live on the grid footprint actually come in town and sell uh, with the businesses. And I've had like a woman telling me like maybe a few weeks ago that when she's up on the hills and she sees the street lights at night, she is very proud, even if she doesn't uh, have electricity in her house. But just looking at the downtown area with the lights and everything, all the benefits, she's very proud of Les Anglais. So um, we are planning on developing 24 microgrids in the next three years. Uh, the region that we are looking at is encircled on the map in, in orange. Uh, we uh, are targeting about 40,000 people uh, based on uh, the number of households we think we can, we can touch and like number of people in the homes. And uh, we hope that people are going to use less and less kerosene lamps and candles. Um, we made a little survey in Tiburon a few months ago and we found out that people are actually spending at least 20 times uh, on, on kerosene and charcoal um, for cooking and for lights compared to, and also like paying for charging their phones compared to what they would have used uh, with the electricity. So they would not have to pay to, uh, to charge their phones. They wouldn't have to buy kerosene and candles. Uh, a candle costs five goods, five Haitian goods and can last one hour. But with five goods of electricity, you can last at least four days uh, with like with lights in your home. So it's a really saving money and it's clean and it's good for the environment. So um, I thank you for um, your attention. And um, if you have any questions, uh, please not hesitate to, to bring them up. Well, thank you, Wendy. That was really, really interesting and uh, shed a lot of light in, in the double meaning on what's happening in Haiti, in Les Anglais, in Tiburon. Very interesting. Just if you go back to the last slide, because there was a question just for clarification. It said $64 monthly saving per family or um, because the saving, or is that total saving 64,000? Or how, how is that meant? Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is like 64 for all, for all those families. I'm sorry. Oh, good. Yes. Oh, good. Like, yeah. good. Because there was a question coming here from the audience. We have a few more questions. And uh, I want to say thank you so much, Wendy. That was really great. We're going to try to take a few questions now. Uh, we have about 17 minutes left total time. So, Piper, I'm going to try to unmute you, and if for some reason it doesn't work, then I'll read out your question, but give it a try. Hi, Max. Hi, Wendy. Good to see you both. Hi, Piper. Hi. My question is, um, Wendy, back to the, to the spark meters. Uh, we haven't talked about this before, but it just dawned on me to ask about um, the perhaps necessary maintenance or monitoring for those meters. Um, have they ever failed? Do customers mm -hmm. trust the meter's veracity? Uh, just curious about the spark meters. Yes, uh, so yeah, that's a good question. And I would like to share with you uh, my screen uh, about this is the spark meter interface, for example. So um, for example, if a customer doesn't uh, believe that, uh, uh, that they have, for example, if you, you are a customer and you want to buy electricity, and uh, you pay for um, for like 50 goods or like uh, of electricity, but you don't believe you don't believe that the vendor actually put that. You can you can ask any vendor or come to our store, and we have all the like transaction history here. 
So for the, this is um, an Earthspark account. So uh, you can see like all the time, this is actually a postpaid account. Most customers are prepaid. But uh, if I go on any customer, um, for example, I'm just going to go on a random customer. Um, so um, this customer, for example, uh, I can see like all the transactions that happened in the, from the first day he got the meter. So all of it is stored on the, on the system. Um, so the customer can come and check and you can see on what day the transaction happened, which vendor did it. And then, um, so you can see if it was processed and the name of the customer and the address, etc. So this gives um, any customer, any time they want to check it, they should be able to, to, to check it from any vendor or from the store. Uh, regarding maintenance, fortunately, we don't have much maintenance on our side. Uh, any maintenance or upgrades are done by uh, the Spark Meter team. Um, but we do have some checks that we do uh, from time to time, uh, especially if we have some lightning or if we have like bad internet, it might happen that we need to check if a meter is not operating, it's not responding. So um, we might have to go on the pole and check the meter if the interface is not giving us enough information. Uh, but there is a very like low maintenance, almost like no maintenance on the meters. Yeah. And I think there was also a question about trust. And of course, yeah. you talked about the electricity theft. So that's trust mm -hmm. on the grid operator or or also on your on your end so then the question is do the customers trust the whole system and how did you get them to trust so uh we did have some issues where customers like in the past customers for example would buy for a hundred goods but only get like 50 goods of electricity on their account uh, and if ever if this happens with a vendor the vendor is automatically out, like we cannot really, we won't keep the vendor. Uh, but if a customer buys a hundred goods and um, does, doesn't feel like he got a hundred goods, so we can ask them uh, to come to the store and we can show them like all the transactions that were done. Uh, and they can, they can tell us the date they bought the electricity. For example, for this person, we can see that on the 16th of July of last year, they bought 150 goods and um, that was um, from the magazine, from our energy store. And Orinel is one of our vendors. We can see that uh, five days later, he bought 90 goods from that vendor and we can see if it was processed. And if ever um, we find that whatever the amount he, he bought doesn't match what was added on his account, then the vendor will have to, we will have to talk to the vendor and to understand what happened. Um, but in general, uh, we make sure that when we do community meetings, we explain to customers that they are uh, allowed to, um, to actually have access to their, to their account. And we're actually developing um, another project right now, which is a kiosk. Uh, where the customers will be able to go and access the information themselves. So by accessing the information themselves, uh, it's like they can uh, input their own code and see it for themselves, and it's going to add another layer of trust to the system. Great. Great. And just one technical question. How do the meters, the smart meters, the spark meters communicate with you? Uh, are they remotely? Is there is there like a radio communication or is it over wire? Yes, exactly. So we have a base station where we have a modem and a router in our store or any other C a safe, secured spot. And then uh, the meters communicate through like radio waves between each other uh, as long as they are a maximum of 100 kilometer direct line of sight. So it's a very long range. And uh, yeah, just like radio waves, you don't need any wires. Uh, they just need to be connected. Uh, every customer uh, meter is connected with the distribution line. And then the meter is just going to like communicate among themselves and like to the base station. So they send like signals every 15 minutes. Uh, the signals are like they are sent to the cloud as well. So we can access the, the meter information 
on the internet, but also if you're uh, in the town, you can use a local area, a local network um, to just access the information. So Great. it's much quicker locally. So for example, if I have to turn off a meter uh, remotely, it's going to take at most maybe seven minutes. But if I'm in Les Anglais in our store, it can take one minute to turn. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Impressive. Uh, it certainly is more advanced than um, most distribution grids in, in, uh, I've, I've seen in, in Europe. So it's very, very impressive. We have another question. And Shannon, I don't know if you can actually talk where you are. I just try to unmute you. So if you can ask your question yourself, please go ahead. Hi, Shannon. Can you hear us? We, we can't hear you yet. Otherwise, I'll read out the question. So it's a, it's a broader question. What is the structure of the utilities and electricity companies in Haiti? Is there one utility for the country or multiple across the country? And um, then there's a second part uh, about the engagement with local government uh, what is involved in partnering with the utilities? Yes, thank you. Yeah, that's a very uh, interesting question. So we are um, in Haiti. We have Electricité d'Haïti, which is the ED, called the EDH. It's uh, the national company that uh, provides electricity in uh, most uh, towns, like in the big towns. They have regional grids. Um, so they actually purchase electricity from private companies that actually uh, use generators uh, to produce and then they sell to the public. So, uh, but there is a, a big mismanagement, unfortunately, and a lot of um, the companies, financial, financial is not doing very good uh, because there are many, there's a lot of uh, electricity theft and people don't pay their bills. Um, so it's not very, it's not working very well. And um, electricity in Haiti is uh, in most of the towns where the EDH operates. Uh, it's not 24/7. Uh, there are towns that have electricity a few hours per week. With the fuel crisis that we're going through, uh, some towns have had maybe only four days of electricity in a whole month. Um, so it's like very, very difficult for anyone who doesn't own their own uh, generator or their own solar home system uh, to actually have a business that relies on electricity or even just using electricity on a day to day basis. Um, and uh, we have an, a few, a couple of like other microgrid companies. Um, for example, Earthspark uh, is a nonprofit and Energy Pop who manages and operates the, the company is a social enterprise, uh, meaning that our objective is not to like become very rich. We just want to cover up our operating cost and make sure we can uh, scale and like expand and keep giving good, um, good conditions to our employees. Uh, but there is another company that's not far from Les Anglais. Um, it's a cooperative. Uh, and it uh, reunites like three towns. Uh, they have just one generation system and then we have distribution lines connecting those three towns. And there's another microgrid company that's, uh, it's, it's like a very, um, its business model is more like profit making. And um, so it's like different, different models for the different companies. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, basically that's that's the free model. You have like EDH, uh, uh, which is like the state company, and then you have in the rural areas, it's only uh, the private sector really that's that's operating. So you said your goal is to cover your costs and also even have a little bit extra for um, investments. Um, yes. Do you succeed in this? Do you cover your costs? So. Um, we are able to cover our operating costs. That is, if we have to buy diesel for our employees, uh, buy supplies. Um, but it's uh, developing microgrid in Haiti in the rural area. It's still very challenging. There are many risks. Uh, for example, you can see that um, 
they have been we have been through a big cyclone we have lost uh, a lot of our assets uh, the the grids in Les Anglais and Tiburon have been built thanks to a lot of grants and we are trying to move away from like only grant funding because uh, you cannot uh, have a sustainable model that depends only on, on grants. Th so that's why uh, we have Port Spent Power the, that has been like uh, set up by Earthspark. Uh, this is going to be the microgrid development company that's going to use like blended financing like grants equity um, to uh, help develop the microgrids. So yes, we were able to cover our operating costs, but um, like to cover up all the like recover our our capex, it it's a different story. Right, right, and um, and of course, I mean, you also probably learn and improve. You had the first microgrid, now you built the second microgrid. And you said you want to go for twenty four as the the next near term target, and then. Uh, do you, do you want to cover all of Haiti in the end, or is there a long-term strategy? So, um, so I'm going to go back to that uh, map of Haiti, uh, which uh, shows all the towns where we have done uh, the market study. So Les Anglais is in the south around here. Uh, Cass is part of Les Anglais as well, and Tiburon is the next town. So our aim is to cover the, the Grand Sud, how, how, we, how we call it, like the south. Uh, first, and uh, then uh, since with the RFP that has been launched this year, there are new actors in the microgrid sector in Haiti, which is very good, uh, meaning that more people are interested in providing electricity. Um, so uh, we are interested in like um, focusing on the south for the moment, and then uh, after the first phase of the 24 grid, uh, if there are any other regions that are still needing electricity and where no the company or no the organization has been yet then yes we uh, we hope to be able to cover like all the 80 towns that we've in identified in the market study uh, but that's going to be in another phase great great and now uh, of course i mean if if i look at this of course if i ask you what what kind of support or uh, um, contribution you might want to get from other people i mean of course the very first obvious answer is maybe money but beyond that um are there aspects do you think is there an interest in in learning what other people do in terms of microgrid i mean i see here piper foster wilder on the phone she's with 60 hertz which runs um, microgrids in in alaska in the very different climate of course and we also had at the conference, we had Steve McLean from Strategic Microgrid, which is in, in Arizona, so uh, which is very dry climate, also different from, they don't have uh, cyclones, they don't have tropical storms. Um, but any, anyway, so the, the question is, what interest is there? is there? Is there something where you say, oh, we would like to learn or we would like to teach, we would like to get people uh, together, or or is the focus for you more local and um, more? We have enough right now. We want to get this on the ground. Definitely, we uh, we are looking to like improve our system. For example, uh, the first phase in Les Anglais, we had uh, lead acid batteries, and we replaced them with lithium ion. We want to keep getting better. Uh, I had a chance to meet like Piper uh, a few months earlier and like discussing about like 60 Hertz and there are, like many other like solutions that are gonna become very, um, very important as we scale up because managing one microgrid or two microgrid is not very difficult, but as you have more grids and you cannot be everywhere at the same time, yes, definitely we're gonna have to like, um, work with other companies to see how they can help us in like managing uh, those grids efficiently. So um, yes, there's always learning. We always want to go like better, like have the last latest technologies. And uh, we are looking now into um, doing 100% renewable. So we are thinking for the next 24 grids, we won't have any diesel generator. Uh, 
so um, we, we we need to see how uh, we have we can work by maybe um, uh, you know with demand side management how we can work with the community and like how we can work with other partners to help us achieve all those goals so it is always a learning process and always uh, working with partners who have the uh, the expertise to help us achieve those goals is like very very important to us great wonderful well that's that looks like an interesting challenging interesting stimulating future uh wendy thank you so much our time is up already uh thank you everybody for joining us uh thank you for asking questions shannon and piper especially but also everybody who just dialed in and watched and listened Wendy, thank you so much for um, spending time with us here today. Everybody, I invite you to come to our website, energyfuturex.org, and find out more about the Energy Future Exchange, and let's stay in touch. And I hope to see you soon again. Just a very short teaser. Next week, we have a webinar on a different topic. It's with Mike Messina from Woosh. It's about... Um, uh, automated or an intelligent fish ladder. So it's about hydropower, it's about hydro dams and how to make them more fish friendly and more efficient. So it's very different from solar microgrids, uh, but uh, definitely very interesting too. Very interesting for achieving a totally carbon neutral energy system, which we all want to work for together. So thank you all so much. Have a great weekend. And see you then next week at the same time, same place. Thank you so much, Wendy. Take care and let's be in touch soon again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.